Holloway in North London is known for being a safe and quiet suburb. And 39 Hilldrop Crescent is just an example of this being a safe and quiet area of London. But Chief Inspector Sir Walter Do would disagree. As he approached the coal cellar of the abandoned house, he started noticing tiles were loose. So he started picking up the tiles and then he found a shovel outside. And he dug a couple of tiles up and realised in a shallow grave there was a body of a headless woman with barely any limbs left and skin. 39 Hilldrop Crescent is not the picturesque safe house you'd imagine in Holloway. No, it's a house of Holy Harvey Crippen, a homeopathic doctor with a murderous tendency. Today's episode of True Crime Cases, we'll be looking at Dr. Crippen, Murder in Holloway. Holly Harvey Crippen was born in Coldwater, Michigan on September 11th, 1862. He was born to Andres Skinner and Myron Crippen who worked as a merchant. Norlaf was pretty much known about the early and childhood years of Crippen that we know he was very comfortable in life, his family had a lot of money so he didn't show violent tendencies or his parents showed him violence probably apart from correcting him when he was being naughty as a child which is standard so he's not showing the big serial killer traits. Crippen would go on to study homeopathy at the Michigan State University but would further his education by studying homeopathy as an MD in Cleveland, which he would go on to open his own practice in New York City a couple of years later. Crippen was a very reserved and quiet man, and he would go on to meet his first wife, who was quite in tune with his personality. And the only reason I'm saying this is because the next person we'll be bringing up will be very different to Dr. Crippen himself. He would go on to meet Charlotte Bell, who was an Irish nurse in New York City. The pair would marry, and Crippen and Charlotte would have a son called Holy Otto. But sadly, this was a, a happy marriage which would end soon, because Charlotte would suffer a stroke and pass away. To cope with his grief, Dr. Crippen would go into his practice a lot more and his studies forgetting a lot about Hawley. Hawley Otto was eventually moved on to Charlotte's parents in California but Dr. Crippen would carry on doing his studies and practicing in New York City. In 1894 he would go on to meet the 17 year old Corrine Cora Turner. This is the person which is very opposite to Dr. Crippen. Corrine was a loud and outgoing person compared to Crippen's more reserved, shy and nervous personality. Corrine had dreams. She wanted to be a person who was known on the grand opera stages of Brooklyn, of Manhattan, Jersey, the Bronx. Brooklyn and Bronx are the same thing, but so on, all through New York through New York State and across of the east coast of America. The only problem with Corrine, she was, quite frankly, terrible. She had no discernible talent to carry on this dream that she had. But Dr. Crippen supported her and the pair would eventually get married. And in this time, Crippen will find out that Corrine is not her real name or Cora. She is named Kundigan Matamoski. Her father was a Russian Pole and her mother was German. So that assumes why her name's changed. Her family would eventually emigrate to America to get away from the Tsarist regime in Russia, which was at the time a bit crap, I'm gonna admit. This is before Tsar Nicholas. 
So they fled to get a better life in the land of the free and where you could prosper in this land, the Americans would say. So Corrine Turner and Crippen would eventually marry. The couple would live in New York for a couple of years. Crippen would find another job after closing his practice at Dr. Munyon's Patent Medicines. And then they would make the big, big step of moving to London. The 1897 move to London was a very, very, but yeah, I'm going to just say, it's a very strange decision for Crippen to make. Crippen's homeopathy or homeopathic qualifications was rendered useless as soon as he stepped foot in England, whether he landed in Scotland, Wales, Liverpool, Cornwall, London, wherever part of Britain he landed in, Northern Ireland as a whole at the time, it was rendered useless. Even in Canada, which was part of the um, empire, his, homeop his homeopathic qualifications rendered useless. So in Crippen's sense, this was a bizarre decision he's made. But in the sense of Cora Turner, the decision was great because London had a great scene in the opera and performing arts and she'd also go by a stage train called Belle Elmore which was very more romantic and suitable but when the pair arrived in London they lived in numerous locations and lived a very very lavish lifestyle. Crippen still worked for Dr Mannion but as an international distri distributor and Dr Mannion at this time was going through a lot of legal action the thing is, Crippen would eventually lose his job because he was so concentrated on pushing Cora's career. But the Dartford and Bedford, um, this is this is quite notorious actually. But the Dartford and Bedford Theatre, where Cora performed, she was booked in for a week of a residential performances, and after the first night, she was hissed off the stage. And this technically is worse than booing. I'd rather be booed off the stage if I was that bad than hissed. A day later, she was contacted by the um, theatre and told not to return to do her performances. The critics in England were a lot harsher to her, but Crippen still persevered to a domineering wife and tried to push her career which earned him the sack from Dr. Munyon's patent medicine. So, Crippen was jobless and he had to find something fast. Crippen would go on to work for the Druitt Institution of the Deaf as a manager and he would start earning £3 a week. At this time, the marriage between Cora and Crippen was failing. So, the couple would start exploring their options. Crippen would eventually take on 17-year-old Ethel Leneve as his sec secretary and typist at the Institution of the Deaf. While Cora started having an affair with an American performer called Bruce Miller, who seems to be more in tune with her personality and more in love with her than Crippen was. So they start both taking in affairs and mistresses and whatever the female or the male equivalent to a mistress is. But another odd decision came from Crippen and that was to rent 39 Hilldrop Crescent on Camden Road in Holloway. This was a three story home as I said in the introduction and it cost £58 a year to rent. So a third of his rent went a third of his wage went on to his rent, which at the time was considered a bit ludicrous. But again, Crippen has pushed a lavish lifestyle which he could not afford for Cora Turner. The order of these two rent in 39 Hilldrop Crescent was just basically to have separate bedrooms for their failing marriage. Because at the time, again, divorce is very like uncommon. And it was also seen as like a sort of a sin in old-fashioned timey-winey senses. 
1908, Crippen decided to start taking Ethel and Eve, who was in her 20s at the time, in as his own mistress, while Cora was still having an affair with Bruce Miller and many of her lodgers. This is how the marriage was failing, and this is how it went. On January 31st, 1910, things were, did take a little bit of a dark turn. Cora and Holly started having guests over from food, and these were two of the close friends of Cora. Paul and Clara Martinelli came over for a nice meal, and Paul needed to go to the toilet. And he asked to where the toilet was, which was based upstairs. And Crippen failed to escort him. So Cora Turner berated, humiliated and embarrassed him at the dinner table. Right in front of the guests. Which made him feel very uncomfortable. And obviously embarrassed Crippen. Which is fucking ridiculous. I'm not gonna lie. I'm not. I don't like swearing in these videos. But jeez, <laughs> it's just going to the loo, man. What the hell is going on? Paul and Clara didn't leave the Crippen's residence until 1 a.m. on February the first. Little they knew this would be the last time they would see Clara alive. Because a couple of days went by and people didn't notice anything. And then a couple of questions were asked by many of Clara's friends in the stage world, wondering where she was. Crippen would brush this off casually, saying that she'd pop back to America to visit her family in New York City. But another bizarre decision that Crippen made, and a lot of bizarre decisions, that she had fallen ill. Bear in mind, this wasn't even after a week after his first story came out so she's fallen ill and dying and then about a week later you claim that she has passed away but these stories didn't convince everyone obviously because they were poorly planned out and poorly thought of and said in a bit of a panic when people questioned him Paul and Clara Martinelli and a Welsh strong woman called Kate Williams also goes by the name of Volcana reported this to the Metropolitan Police in Scotland Yard. The Metropolitan Police actually passed this case on a couple of months later to Sir Walter Dew, who was a who was a detective inspector for the police who previously worked as a constable for H Division in 1888 on the Jack the Ripper case. So this is pedigree at its finest. So Walter Dew decided that he would look into this case and he would go to 39 Hilldrop Crescent to visit Crippen. At first he wasn't there and he was greeted by Ethel and Eve who was bizarrely wearing Cora's clothes. So Laviv just introduced herself as Crippen's maid and a couple of days later he would return where Crippen was there. So when he started questioning Crippen, Crippen basically turned around and said, I've been lying to everyone, she has left me to be with Bruce Miller in America. So the ruse did work on Walter Do, and so he did ask Crippen to place advertisements in a number of American newspapers just to get Cora to reply to him and say she's alive and they can bury this case. That's fine, it's done, it's closed. She's alive, it's nothing to do about this. And Crippen agreed. And again, things would get a bit more bizarre as we go along. Only a day after Walter Dew's visit to the Crippen residence, the Hildrop Crescent, another decision was made which was stupid because if Crippen stayed at Hilldrop Crescent maybe he could go away with murder literally. Him and Ethel and Neve fled London for Belgium so they travelled to Brussels to get to Antwerp and at the time of the flee what to do was do back at Hilldrop Crescent. 
But Crippen decided to shave his distinctive moustache off and grow a beard. And bizarrely, again, another weird decision that he disguised Ethel and Eve as a boy. When it was noted that she was, had so many female mannerisms. But as Walter Dew went back to Hilldrop Crescent, he discovered the house was just left abandoned and no one was answering her in the door. So he called her into Scotland Yard and basically had the force to get into search residence. And he went back down to the coal cellar, which he previously searched and nothing was found. But this time, doing more of a thorough search, he saw just a pile of coal in the corner, a smashed chandelier, and some branches from the tree outside. But he did notice something very, very different. And it was these tiles, as you noticed in my introduction, what I said about the tiles, lifted them up, and there was a headless corpse with limbs missing, and it was Cora Turner. But he used a calming drug to basically poison Coraways, which was very powerful and it could be used as sort of almost similar like arsenic. And dismembered Cora brutally, which it was a really, really strange way of poisoning someone and then dismembering the body, inflicting the pain after the death. But there was one thing that they knew for sure, the forensics knew for sure, that it was Cora Turner. Just because on her abdomen, she had a scar from a previous operation. There was key evidence that Crippen murdered Cora Turner, or allegedly murdered Cora Turner at the time. But things would get stranger on the SS Montrose. On the SS Montrose, Crippen and Ethel caught the attention of Captain Kendall, who was very well known to mingle with his first class passengers. And, and this is another like really odd decision that he had to make was travel first class, where you are wanted fugitives. And obviously Scotland Yard sent reports out to British ships just, just in case that the suspected the killer fled the scene. So this suspicion was aroused, they were at a dinner table and the captain witnessed a very female mannerisms from a boy, which she ate her food in a certain way, the females who eat their food with the hand and eyes of forks, I don't know. And Crippen had to, in fact, crack nuts for her. And one thing that really, really caught Dr. Crippen was the wireless telegraph. This is very new, it was on the ship, and they had to use it to their advantage. So basically, Captain Kendall has got his telegraphist, Lawrence Ernest Hughes, to send a wireless telegram to Scotland Yard. It read, have a strong suspicion that Crippen, London, seller, murderer and accomplice are among saloon passengers. Moustache taken off, growing beard, accomplice dressed as a boy, manner and build undoubtedly a girl. But if Crippen travels second or first class, you could literally get away with this all. That's the most bizarre thing. But what to do had to make the decision fast. So they had to get on the White Star Line SS Renta from Liverpool. It was a faster ship and it was going to get into Canada before the Montrose. So it was a race against the clock for Walter Do. He had to get his man. So basically, as the SS Montrose entered the St. Lawrence River in Canada, he was already there, Walter Do. Crippen was cornered. So how did he catch Crippen? That's going to be the big question. Walter Doom disguised himself as a pilot and they wanted to board the ship. And the captain was very well aware of this and the Canadian authorities were made aware of this as well. 
So the captain went to Crippen and asked, do you want to see the pilots? And long and behold, the pilot went up to him and it was Walter Do. Walter Do approached Crippen and he said, good morning, Dr. Crippen. Do you know me? I'm Chief Inspector Do from Scotland Yard. You are under arrest for the deaths and mutilation of Cora Crippen. And then Crippen did pause and said, Thank God it's over. The suspense has been too great. I could not stand it any longer. And then Crippen apparently held up his hands ready to be arrested. And another thing I want to say is really bizarre about this decision of going to Canada. Crippen was American. Like I said, he's from Coldwater, Michigan. And he could literally travel directly to the United States. And delays of um, extradition laws would have meant that he could actually stay in America. And maybe potentially, literally again, Gorrow was murder. But obviously following this arrest, like I said, Crippen put his arms out ready to be handcuffed and him and Ethel and Eve were escorted off the ship and put onto a separate ship back to the United Kingdom for trial. On returning to England, it was decided that Crippen and Leneve would be tried separately. A four day trial means that Crippen went first and his defence was basically the Bruce Miller story that she fled to America and went off with this man called Bruce Miller as we talked about in the start previously in the video. But a huge part of this case was the scar tissue. Another part of the defence was that there could be a fold in the skin but this fell f flat because you can clearly see what is a scar and what is also a fold in the skin. And it's alleged that Crippen did say that he didn't conf confess, which he did quite vocally confess on the Montrose, which is still a bizarre defence that Crippen went for. But another big thing that hit the nail in the coffin for Crippen was what he wrapped the body in. Silk pyjamas, which was only a few in existence in London, it was made in Holloway by a tailor, and who ordered four of those pyjamas on record in that style and colour? Holy Harvey Crippen. And Crippen still tried to claim that the body was already there before him and Cora moved into 39 Hill Drop Crescent. So it took 26 minutes for the jury to come with a verdict. And the verdict was found guilty and the judge passed judgment of execution where he would be hanged by the neck until he's dead at Pentonville prison. A couple of days later though, Ethel and Eve was tried in the Old Bailey as well. But her trial fell through pretty much straight away because she was tried as accomplice and I think maybe she had different opinions on this case she was acquitted of all charges. Not long after the trial concluded though, Ethel and Eve moved to the United States of America where she would marry and find a job as a typist. She would return to England though and then die in the 1960s. But the fate of Holly Harvey Crippen was sealed on the 23rd of November 1910. Holly Harvey Crippen at 9am walked slowly up to the gallows in Pentonville prison. He was escorted by the executioner John Ellis and he made one final request before he was hanged. He wanted to be buried with a photo of Ethel and Eve, which was granted. And at 9am the gallows dropped and Holy Harvey Crippen was dead. And that's the end of the story of the London Cellar Murderer. Many people do believe that Crippen isn't the killer, which we'll come to 
another time if we do a revisit of this. I'm not going to do it in this video because I just want to state what's the facts rather than give an opinion on something like this because it is a solved crime. But that doesn't matter. We don't need to know this. An innocent woman has died. No matter how dominant your entry might have been or vile, mean and belittle someone. If still an innocent person had died and buried in that basement, whether it's Cora Turner or someone else, it is still a life lost. Whether the wrong man hang for it or the right man hang for it. That person will never ever be forgotten really. So that is it for this episode of True Crime Cases. If you did like, please give it a thumbs up and you want to see more content, go ahead and subscribe. Like I said, the exploring video is coming very soon because I've got another thing that's popped up and I thought it would be nice and easier just to do more of these True Crime Cases because they are doing popular and I quite enjoy making them. So, the next episode of True Crime Cases is going to be the Osage Murders. The Killers of the Flower Moon, which obviously you might have viewed if you're a film buff, that's going to be the title and plot to the next Martin Scorsese film with DiCaprio and De Niro. And also I have a Halloween special coming up, which is going to be the Hammer Smith Ghost Murders. That'd be a nice little spooky one for Halloween. So keep your eyes peeled, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next episode.